By way of introduce, introduction, for the past two decades, Patsy Salberg has been advising governments on education policy reform. He was an advisor to the National Board of Education, which is the Finnish Ministry of Education. He has been the director of the Center for School Development at the University of Helsinki. For four years, he served as the senior educator in the Europe and Central Asian region at the World Bank, and for two years as the lead policy advisor in the European Training Foundation. Currently, he holds the appointment as director of the Center for International Mobility and Cooperation, the agency which sponsors student and faculty exchanges to Finland. For the last several years, he has been helping to explain the reasons for the success of Finnish schools to international audiences. I saw you on CNN recently. In a recent paper, for instance, he has argued that one critical ingredient is how teachers are selected, trained, and motivated. He has paid particular attention to the role which societal consensus plays in the delivery of effective schools. He has presented his ideas at meetings of the American Federation of Teachers, Education Week's Leadership Forum, and the Iowa Education Summit, among many other organizations. As I mentioned before, he is here today to speak about his new book, which was just released from Teachers College Press, titled Finnish Lessons, What Can the World Learn from Educational Change in Finland? Before we officially welcome um, Passy to deliver his address, I want to thank a few people who were instrumental in inviting um, Passy here. First, my colleague in LPO, Professor Stephen Heinemann, and Sho Craven's Office of International Affairs and Associate Dean for International Affairs at Peabody College. My name is Ellen Goldring, and I'm Chair of Leadership Policy and Organizations, and we're thrilled to be hosting this event um, this afternoon. So let's give a warm welcome to Pasi this afternoon. Thank you. Wow. How are you? Can you hear my voice from here? Yes. Yeah. You know, I was in a, in a speaking occasion like this once and asked this question whether the, my voice is loud enough to be heard and there was somebody in the back seat of the, of the room and said that no I cannot hear you but it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you can't hear me it's just uh, let me know. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful opportunity. This is my second time here in, in Nashville. This is my first time to speak in this very very well-known university. Uh, anybody whom I met before I came here, they're very uh, envy with me because I said that I'm going to go to Nashville and uh, meet people in Vanderbilt. It's a, it's a great honor to be here and it's also a huge privilege to be somebody non-American living in Europe, in Finland, who has been able to um, publish a book here. Uh, my book is uh, published by the Columbia University Teachers College Press and I'm, I'm very proud of this. Uh, this thing. I, I worked many, many years for this, and that's why it's a, it's a great joy to, to be able to share some thoughts about this. I'm not going to tell everything about the book because I want you to buy the book. <laughs> you know, this is what I have learned here in America, that you'll always have to sell your, your writings, which is a nice thing. I, I could never do this in Finland, you know, they, was, they would kill me if I market my own things in an event like this. So there are 30 copies behind there, please, when you leave. <laughs> I can gift wrap them for you for Christmas if you want to give them to somebody. But it's a great book, yeah? Okay? Anyway, um, let me make a couple of remarks and then I'll, I'll speak briefly about some of the things I think will interest you and will also inspire you to the point that you will actually go and buy the book. Uh, but a couple of things are very important to, to be mentioned. Firstly, I'm, I'm not here today to tell you that Finland has the best education system in the world. Yeah? So I'm not telling you that we have the best education system in the world, and my book is not about that, because I simply think that we don't. Yeah? But I, I do believe that we have been able to work out some of the issues that you have, you have on the table here, and many other countries are trying to do. For example, we have been able to design the education system that is at the same time um, equitable for everybody, and excellent in terms of the achievement. It's a remarkable uh, result, isn't it? 
that you have a system that is good for everybody and everybody's learning well. So I think that's, that's the achievement. But it doesn't mean that we have the best education system in the world. Second thing, I'm not here today to tell you that if you only do what Finns have done, everything will be good. Because it, it won't. I'm not offering you any uh, quick fixes or solutions of the Finnish education system that you can implant here in Tennessee or Nashville or United States and then everything will be good. It doesn't work like this. I'm simply sharing with you a story how we in up there in Northern Europe in a small country of about five and a half million people were able to do this thing when we started this journey about 30 or 40 years ago. When there was a lot of poverty in Finland, we had a very kind of an average education system. There was a lot of uh, inequity in the system and we were catching up with practically everybody else. And that's the story. What did we do to come from behind practically everybody to the point where we have been now at the center of global attention for about a decade? And that's the kind of a uh, interesting thing to think about. What, how can you do this? Are the policies that we have been using the same policies that you are considering here or some other countries have done or have we done something different? This is my story this afternoon. Are you ready for this? Okay, you all understand my Eng Finglish? Yeah. <laughs> it's not English, it's Finglish. Yeah, if you don't, let me know because I, um, I can repeat what I'm saying. Yeah. So should I speak from here? Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yes. Much better. How are you? <laughs> should I say everything again? No. No. Okay. <laughs> I was just kidding. All right. Good. Uh, are there anybody from Finland here? Wow. No, if you're Finn, you have to raise your hand like this. <laughs> no. Two, we have two Finns here, okay? You know, there are two types of people in the world. There are Finns. And then there are wannabe Finns, yeah? <laughs> Everybody who reads my book, have read my book, they say, I want to be Finn. I want to come to Finland. Well, the good news is that if you are a teacher and you are not Finn, you are very likely to get married by a Finn because teachers are very hot items in the Finnish <laughs> mate mating markets. <laughs> it used to be quite different if you're a lawyer or doctor or businessman. You had a good chance to get married and find somebody you really like. But now it's a teacher, and particularly even better, if you're a primary school teacher, you are very likely to be chosen very quickly in a nightclub <laughs> in Finland. No, don't laugh, I'm serious about this. You know, this is how it goes. Anybody who has been visiting Finland? Two, three, four, okay, good. So let me ask you, everybody else, all the others, what comes to your mind when you hear the word Finland? It's the first, first image you have. Just tell me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong answer. Okay, accept it. What, el what else? Cold. Reindeer. What else? Homogeneous. Homogeneous, yeah. Good. And more. Whiskey. What? Whiskey. Peacekeep, oh, wonderful, yeah. Wonderful. I heard of whiskey, I'm getting <laughs> thirsty already. One more thing. Development. Yeah, development, okay, good. You know, I'm asking this question because when I, I, as you heard, I've been traveling around the world and talking not only about the Finnish education system, but the importance of educating our children and young people well, okay? And whenever I have a chance to t talk about Finland, I ask people what they think Finland is, and, and this is the Oh, sorry, this is the common uh, image that uh, people have. Yeah? <coughs> that it's always dark and it's cold and ice. And there are more than one who has told me that now I understand why Finland is so good in PISA and these international studies because it's always cold and dark. So there's, there's nothing else to do but do homework and go to school. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, I was, as you heard, I was living three years, two and a half years in Italy. Uh, and two years, exactly two years ago, when I decided to come back to Finland, there were many, my Italian friends came to me and said, that, so we are so sorry that you had to go back home. And I said, why do you say that? Because it's always cold and dark and ice and must be very boring there. <laughs> but that's only 
part, part, of the, part of the picture. This is actually an image that you can see only in Lapland if you go to very north. If you come to Helsinki or south of Finland, there's nothing like this. Yeah, it's like Nashville. <laughs> yeah? This is another image that people often have when they think about Finland. And you can see many things here. One is, of course, that the uh, people love, like nature. But there's also a kind of a feature of Finnish culture that is very important for anybody. And m maybe my fellow citizens here can, can uh, uh, agree with me that Finnish people want to be alone. You know, we don't like too much other people around. <laughs> and we definitely don't, don't want to talk too much about anybody. So we like, we want to be silent and by ourselves. That's a kind of a part of the, part of the nature. It's very difficult for me to, when I moved to Washington DC, to learn this culture of, you know, talking all the time. And I was sweating to find something to say because I didn't have anything to say with my friends, <laughs> but I still had to talk, yeah? And I have, a, I have a nice story actually about this when there were two men in uh, Finland and they were really good friends. And they saw each other by accident after 10, 15 years without meeting. And they didn't even hear what the, what the, the others were doing. So they met in Helsinki and they, they were so delighted about this meeting that they decided to go to a restaurant and have a couple of drinks to celebrate this reunion. So they ordered two vodkas and they drank the vodkas but didn't say anything. So they asked for two more drinks. They had these drinks but still remained silent. A third drinks, the same thing. They didn't say a word. Then when they were having their fourth vodkas, these other friends started to feel a little bit, you know, warm. So he raised his glass and said, kippis. You know, kippis is like cheers. Can you say kippis? kippis. Say it again, kippis. kippis. Yes. And the other guy said, that, did we come here to drink or to talk? <laughs> so this is how much we like, like to have conversations, yeah? And of course, many people think about sports. Some of the best ice hockey players in North America are from Finland. Like in your town here, I think there are some Finns. Is it so? Yeah. yeah? And to, tomorrow night we're gonna see um, Nashville taking Anaheim Ducks here. A lot of Finns and on the ice there then. Sports, all sorts of sports. Actually, there's a, there's a good quiz for anybody who is interested in these things. What is in common with all the sports where Finland is on the top of the world? The best in the world. There's one thing that is, is in common. It's not snow. We have a, the Formula One and rally drivers, right? You have to wear a helmet. <laughs> yeah, there's no other sport where we would be really globally uh, on the top of the world except the ice hockey and rally and Formula One and then ski jumping. Oh, we used to be good in that. And Santa Claus, nobody said Santa Claus, yeah? yeah? Because you think that Santa Claus is from Sweden, right? No, he's a Finnish, uh, Finnish guy. Okay, but you know, if you have these types of I images and then somebody tells you that Finland has a world-class education system, it's very difficult to put these two things into the same picture, right? But if, uh, if I may tell you a little bit about the history, I'm not, this is not the, the presentation about the history of Finland, but it's, uh, my argument is that it's very difficult to understand really Finland or Finnish education without a two-minute course of the Finnish history so that you know where we are coming from because this current state is very much uh, about the past. We have been between the West and the East always and Finland was for 600 years a part of the Kingdom of Sweden in the West that you can see in this map. So we have been ruled and governed by our Western neighbor. Anybody from Sweden here? Welcome. <laughs> So I, now I, I have to delete all my Swedish jokes from this story because I, had, I have many of them. <laughs> but we have, a, we have a very friendly... Yes, oh! Our, yes, our, our dear neighbor in Sweden. And they gave us so much culture and richness and everything. <laughs> but anyway, the kind of a legacy of this, uh, this uh, alliance with Sweden is the language that we have. So we have two languages in Finland, the Finnish and then Swedish language, uh, that is the other uh, domestic language. 
But anyway, we have been part of Sweden for, for centuries. And then there was a thing called the Finnish War in 1809 or 1808, 1809, between the Swedish king and the Russian chars. And they decided to give this little peace between the Sweden and Russia to, to uh, Russia. So we were part of the Russian Empire from 2009 to 1917 when we became independent. And this was again a different time because we were part of the, the other ruler in the East. And these centuries that we lived between these two powers gave an important lesson for Finns, that we had to learn how to survive between these big powers. Yeah? We never really had a kind of a strong identity like this country has had since the independence. You know, that's why to be American is something important. Yeah? To be a Finn is something very different because to be a Finn it means that you are always <laughs> governed by somebody, you are always looking upwards to some other people, your neighbors, and you're very unsure about who you are. Yeah? You know, that's why we are still carrying this Finnish identity that you know, we, we never want to be number one in the world and we never think too much of ourselves. And it's, a, it's the same thing with education. We have never wanted to be number one or best in the world. Yeah? For us, it's enough to be better than Sweden. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and then, finally, we are now in a situation where Finland is part of this European Union that is in a, in a deep trouble financially, one of the 27 member states. And this situation as an as a independent nation, as a part of the European family, would not be possible without having this kind of a sense of survival, a skill how to survive in this situation. Um, and of course, the, the best thing to do is to cultivate your mind and, and uh, brain. So that's why the importance of education and literacy comes from this tradition and, and past. And with Sweden, we share the same history of the, the religious history as well, which is a very important part of the whole story. So we have to understand this ed education um, uh, position that Finland has also in the light of the history and how, how important it is and has been to be a literate person. For example, one anecdote about this um, importance of religion. You know, Finland is a Lutheran state and unlike Sweden where the, the church and the, the state have been separated recently, we still have the, the state and the church is, is a kind of a same unit. And part of this Lutheran tradition is that you have to be literate before you can get married. Did you know that? It, and it's been so for centuries. So in the beginning it was a task of the church to make sure that all young boys and girls learn how to read. And only when you are literate you will get the license to get married. And that's why it was so, it's been important now for these several centuries to, to educate yourself to get a position and status in the society, get married and have children. Yeah. This is where the, where the history has given us a lot. So now if you look at the Finland today and Finnish history, uh, the, the Finnish achievements, you see some, something like this. You probably don't know that Angry Birds is a Finnish thing. Do you know Angry Birds? Yeah? Steve Jobs used to play Angry Birds as well and, and many others. So it was invented by two Finnish um, uh, young guys, actually. Uh, we have the gender equity that you can see there with our president and prime minister, education. Uh, Linus is the, uh, who invented the Linux operating system, this guy. Nokia used to be a great thing. We have diplomacy, like somebody said, peacemaking. Um, Mr. Ahtisari there, and music and arts. And then there's this Newsweek story. Remember, there was a last year, August last year, there was a kind of a cover story in the Newsweek where they uh, found out what is the best country in the world. And when you read the story, it says the best country in the world is Finland, Finland right? Yeah. And uh, you know what's interesting there is that when this was published in uh, in August 17 last year, there were two phone calls that morning to the, newspaper, uh, the Newsweek headquarters asking for a recount, <laughs> saying that it's not possible, it cannot be Finland, they, you must have made a mistake. Do you know where these phone calls came from? <laughs> no? 
No Sweden, no Moscow. They both came from Helsinki. Yeah? So this is how the Finns are. We don't, we don't believe that we are that good. So it was the two newspapers from, from Helsinki, they asked Newsweek to, to do the recount. And for a few hours there was a kind of a period of nobody knew what is the best country actually in the world until the Newsweek in the afternoon said that no, it is Finland. <laughs> and this uncertainty became because education is one of the, one of the kind of the indicators that they use for these metrics there. And 100 points is the maximum that you can get from, if you have a perfect education system, you get 100 points. And Finland's score in education was 102. And that's why somebody thought that you know, it, it's not possible. And this somebody was somebody in Finland. Anyway, this is where we are. And, and the, the Finnish story is not only about education, it's about this building a society that has been successful in many other areas of life. We are also known as a country with a very little corruption or good governance, if you wish, to, to put it this way. Um, very active and well-implemented sustainable development policies, high developed technology, very competitive national economy and many other things. So it's important that we are not only looking at education, but many other things have been very successfully developed in Finland. And for me, for example, it's not a, a kind of a surprise that education is doing so well in Finland because we are doing very well in many other areas in society. Are you still with me? Yeah, yeah? you're still awake? Because I can put more lights here if you want to. <laughs> okay, let's go to the look at the education and I, I show you very quickly some of the things that I think are important and then I speak to you about four things that may be surprising and I think it will be also very difficult to understand how you can put these four things into the picture of a world-class, well-performing education system. But one notion I want to make, and this is, this, uh, is related to my, my first earlier remark, it's very important to keep in mind that Finland has not always been a good, well-known and recognized education system, because something like this has happened. That we started from behind in 1970s and 80s in, in many areas, including the learning achievement, the participation or graduation rates, the efficiency, how, how we spend our money, and also the equity. And in all these areas and some others, if we put together a kind of an indicator or index, we can see that Finland has been able, able to steadily improve the performance and progress. And now we, are, we have passed many others, almost everybody else in, in all these areas. So now the question is that what did we do? This is how, how the question looks like. And I could speak lengthy about this and explain all the details, but I'm not going to do this. So if you take a look at this, you, first thing you see is that it's a fairly simple scheme, okay? Finnish young people, they go to school when they are seven, okay? So until seven, the schooling, the, what they do, what the parents do with the children is up to the parents to decide. There's one, uh, one year preschool there, as you see, at the age of six. It's a half day school and half day kindergarten or play. And still everything before that is not regarded as education. It's part of the social uh, services administration. So our education um, formally begins at the age of seven. And then children go to school when they are, uh, until they are 16 or they have completed nine years of education. And then they are free to do whatever they want to do. Then there's an upper secondary school, as you see, with two options, unlike you have here. In high school, we can choose academic high school or vocational, and then higher education with two different uh, options as well. Another thing that is in, may interest you here is that everything is paid by the government here, including higher education. Education in Finland is considered as a human right for everybody, just like in Sweden. We have the same, same um, constitutional principle in both countries. So if you study in a PhD program in the university, you never pay anything. If you study in a high school or vocational school, they're all free uh, for people. It's all paid by taxpayers' money. Okay, it also includes the American young people. So if you want to send your children, or if you want to come and study in our universities, it's free for you too. Yeah? So we, have, we don't have a way to, yet, it may change, but we don't have a way yet to um, charge money for education from anybody. So it's all paid by somebody. Okay. So these four things are 
like this. I, I call these a Finnish ways of, uh, of Finnish paradoxes, actually, because these are different things. The first one is about really about equity and e equality of educational opportunities. One of, the f one of the features of our education policy and reform since 1970s is that we have been driving the changes in our education system by the equity as a main principle. Equity meaning that the most important thing for the Finnish educators and policymakers has been to make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity to be successful and it, to, to, um, to participate in education. Okay? So let me show you this picture from the OECD data. How many of you know what the PISA, OECD PISA is? Okay. The OECD PISA is a <coughs> study that they, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development based in Paris is doing every three years in all of these member countries. United States is one of those and Finland and there are 32 other countries. So they, they are measuring the literacy, maths and science performance in these countries. And one of the things that are, is not so often um, discussed is the, the equity in, in within these countries that are participating in the PISA. Normally people on, only see, if you look at the newspapers and there's a story of PISA, there's always this ranking of United States is number 15 and other countries something else. But there's much more behind these numbers and I think we should be looking at this. I'm not showing these rankings at all. But this is one of the interesting things because this will show you what, how, the, how different the students' performance in different countries has been in this study that is in science in 2006. It could be any, any year really, there's not much difference there. But the, the size of the bar shows you the, the variation of students' performance in different countries. Okay? And now I can break it down into two different, um, uh, two different parts here. Now this lower, this orange part will show you how much of this variation of the student performance is, comes from the between school variation. In other words, how different the schools are within these systems. And then there's a within school variation is all the rest. Okay? And the interesting thing here is that the countries are, the OECD countries are very different in terms of how different or similar their schools are in terms of students learning science or maths or, or literacy. You will see that the United States is there somewhere in the middle. Actually, the United States is a very typical OECD country in terms of the, the between school variation of students' performance. Okay? So it means that you have quite a lot of differences between different schools in this country, meaning that you have very good schools and then you have schools that are struggling. Okay? But it's not like in Germany, for example. Germany is, Germany is an extreme case here. And this we can explain this German case here with the structure of education because in Germany when you are 11 years of age you will choose between three different types of schools. Anybody from Germany here? No? Okay. So this is what you, what you will see that when you are 15 you, are, you have students who are studying in a very very different schools. You have a very vocationally oriented school, schools and then very good grammar schools and that's why they have the big difference. But look at Finland there. Finland has this very small, tiny little red bar which indicates that the difference, performance difference between Finnish schools is, is very small in all areas. And that's why, like Stephen was saying today earlier, that Finland is mostly known by this very small between school variation. Let me tell you what would it mean if you're a parent in Finland. If you're a mother and father and having children going to school, you will never, ever worry about where to find a good school. And it's partly because of the statistics that we know that all the schools are good. Or, let, let me put it this way, we don't know where the bad schools are. And this is so, something that people here in America, they often ask me that, how do you know where the, where the bad schools are or who are the bad teachers? And I often say that we don't have them. Because we don't, we don't measure these things. Yeah? Whenever you measure, then you know, but we are not interested in these things because the goodness or badness is defined in a different way in, in Finland. But this is a very important, this equity part of the system is uh, more important in Finland than the academic excellence that many other education systems are keeping as a main, uh, main aim of the system. 
The other one is I called this paradox the less is more because some, some of these things are rather controversial in terms of put, putting them in the same picture of the well-performing or high-performing education system. Let's see what I have here. Well, the first one is that I'm always interested in seeing how teachers are doing and what they do in the different countries. And this is again from the OECD data database. This only shows you how differently teachers experience their work in the different countries. Okay, this will show you the total number of teaching hours in, in the typical of the typical middle school teacher in different countries. You will see that there New Zealand, Mexico, United States teachers are teaching much more every day and every week and every year than they do in um, Finland or Italy or Japan. Okay? And this shows that this means in, in Finnish situation, that this means that teachers have many other responsibilities than the classroom teaching. Yeah? In Finland, teachers are responsible for the school curriculum, they are responsible for reporting um, the students' progress to parents and authorities. We don't have any standardized way of testing kids. They are responsible for the overall welfare of, of children in the school and many other things. And this is, this is where much of the teacher's time will, uh, will go. This is another interesting thing because some people sometimes argue that maybe Finnish students are doing well in the school because they do, they have a lot of homework and they spend many hours in school. But these both are wrong. First of all, this is again from the OECD data and you can see that Finland has one of the, one of the lowest numbers of instruction of all countries when we sum up the intended instruction hours between the ages of 7 and 14. Yeah? I don't have the, the OECD doesn't have the data from the United States because of your the structure of your education. It's the states that are deciding these things. But some, many people tell me that United States typically is on the other side, on the right hand side of the scale. That your children have much more hours of instruction uh, in school than we do. And then if we put here the homework. How much homework do you do your children in middle school? What junior high school do every day? What do you say? One hour. Two hours, Two hours a day. Yeah, okay. In Finland, it's a typical. Uh, that our recent survey showed that in the middle, in the junior high school, students normally do 28 minutes homework every day. And in primary school, there's no homework, practically no homework. High school is a completely different thing because then. Uh, students have been selected there already to do different things. Is it all right? Yeah? I think you're puzzled. No? Me too. Okay, the other thing for this less is more thing is the money. And uh, there are people who argue that maybe Finland is doing well because we spend a lot of money in education. This is again from the OECD data. You can see the correlation between the, the cost of education and there in the x-axis you will see how much on average countries are spending per pupil um, before they are sitting the OECD PISA test at the age of 15. And then in the y-axis you can see the um, performance, I think it's in the science 2006 again. And again, it doesn't matter, it can be science or maths or literacy in 2009 study as well. The result is a different. So this simply shows that the more money we spend, the less the students are learning. Which doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah. But there are many economists, right, Stephen, who are saying that the money is not the solution to this thing. That you, you, cannot, you cannot argue... Yeah, but you, you, you cannot argue saying that if we only have more, had more money and we could spend more, we could get more, more uh, better results. It's not about this. It's a, how you spend the money and what do you do uh, in the system in the first place. Okay? So it's not, you know, all these things that you see here about Finland are uh, quite difficult to understand. We spend less time, we do less homework, we teach less and we less, spend less money than most others, but we still get the equitable high outcomes. 
Okay? So there has to be something in the way Finland has been formulating the policies and doing these things. Okay, now comes the thing that is probably very close to your hearts here in the Nashville, Tennessee and this beautiful state. It's about standardized testing, yeah? Good, as I told you, the, the Finland is not really doing too much um, uh, external testing and no standardized testing at all. Look at this image here that I have made for you. Uh, again, using the OECD database that is publicly available. Anybody can go there and you know, download this data and construct these pictures. I have taken here the mathematics in the three consecutive PISA studies starting from year 2000. So you see 2000, blue is 2003, and then uh, the white is 2006 uh, mathematics. And the countries selected here, these are not all the OECD countries, so I have selected the uh, United States, UK, Canada, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and Ireland. And you qu quickly see that in all of these countries, the mathematics performance is declining, right? So now, for all the policymakers, the good question is that what was going on in the education policies in these countries in the 1990s? You know, the, what the politicians often conclude wrongly is that they are looking at what they are doing now, what's wrong with our school now because the kids are not learning. But we really have to look at the education policies 10 years ago, okay? And 10 or 15 years ago from this, uh, this data that you see here, there was a very common belief that we have to test our children more, we need more data from the schools so that we can improve and fix uh, the, the problems, yeah? So all of these countries that you can see here more or less believed that we need more testing, we need more competition so that we can improve the quality of learning. And none of these countries were really successful with this, right? Now, let me put the small Finland here, okay? So you can see how Finland, who was actually actively resisting this idea. I was working in the ministry in 1990s in Finland, and I remember how hard we had to work to keep these standardized tests away from our system. There were many who were insisting that we have to have similar testing and national assessment systems like many other countries do. England was a great model for many countries in Europe in the 1990s. And many countries and many ministers believe that we have to do exactly what England has done. I think England has also been a great inspirer of American education here in many ways. But we were able to keep these ideas away. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more. But you can see that we have been able to improve, you know, cycle after cycle from the very high, uh, high point already in 2000 yeah? without any standardized testing or any inspection or any control. It's interesting, isn't it? At least in, in the Finnish case, the argument that we cannot change the syst education system unless we have data and tests doesn't work because we have been able to do this um, systematically throughout the, the last um, uh, two decades without uh, testing. Somebody in Finland gave me this picture uh, to illustrate how Finnish teachers feel about standardized examinations or standardized testing. For those who cannot read this or if you don't understand English, I can, I can read what this examiner who is, you know, when I look at this picture, I can see that there's a teacher and, there, and there's a classroom of children who are very different. You know, in Finland we have an inclusive education policy, which means that we have to keep, we want to keep all the different children in the same class, okay? So we are not segregating pupils to different ability groups or so. We want to have everybody in the same class. And this is exactly the, how, how the teacher will see this thing, that they are very, very different students. Okay? And this teacher or examiner is saying that for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb the tree. And there are many teachers, this is how they tell me in Finland, that we know already when we have to give this type of test to these children that many of them will, uh, will not be successful. Yeah. There's no way that they can make it. Just like this elephant. Can you imagine this, this elephant trying to climb the tree? It doesn't matter how hard he or she tries, it will never, never work. Yeah? And many Finnish educators feel exactly the same way, that, that we have to have another way to, if you want to use the word, measure how the children are doing or how the schools are performing. We cannot really rely on only the standardized um, testing. Then the fourth and the last one is the 
um, it's about teachers. I think Finland is a, the only country in the world at the moment where we have a privilege every year, every spring, to select some of the best of the best high school graduates into our primary school teacher education programs. It's one of the most competitive academic uh, university programs. And remember, it's free of charge. People don't need to worry about the, the cost. And only very lucky ones will be accepted. This is how the situation with the applicants and accepted has changed during the last 10 years. You can see that since 2001, there has been between five to 7,000 applicants into eight universities in Finland where primary school teachers are trained. Now I'm talking about primary school teachers, not anybody else, okay? And we annually take about 600, uh, 650 or 700 students. So it's a roughly 10% acceptance rate. And you have to be a really good high school graduate. And unless you can sing and dance and do sports and paint, it will be very hard to get in. Almost everybody who is accepted, they have to do some music. Yeah? And everybody who is accepted, all of those, 100%, they are very good in mathematics and science. Because you have to do, you have to be very good in maths to, to get there, yeah? I teach a little bit every year in the University of Helsinki, that is our largest university. And last summer we had, we received the record number of applications to this teacher, uh, primary school teacher education program. 2,400 young people competed over 120 seats. 5% were accepted. There was one young woman there who came for the seventh time. Yeah? And she was studying economics already in the university, but she wanted to be a primary school teacher and she was accepted. But this was her seventh time to try to get in. So that's how hard young people try to get there. And that's how much te teaching and to be a teacher today is appreciated in Finland. Yeah? Is it amazing? Yeah, you know, this is a kind of a bedrock of the all education system that we have. And unless you have this privilege of having your most able and talented young people in your primary schools, where in Finland we have a system where normally the same teacher is following the same class from the grade one to grade six. So the same teacher is living with his children six years and trying to get best out of them is making a huge difference. Yeah? And so these teachers who graduate, they normally study very quickly. They find a job and they never leave. You know, it's very rare that you will leave teaching if you are a primary school teacher or teacher in general. In the United States, I know that about half of your teachers leave before the end of the fifth year. Yeah? And replacing one teacher in your system costs about $20,000. It's a huge cost, yeah? So that's, that's one of the secrets or one of the explanations of the, the strong education system that we have, that we have strong elementary and primary school teachers there. Okay, so can we learn from Finland or what can we learn from Finland? Let me show you some, some of these things. I'm using in my book when you uh, hopefully go and buy this great Christmas, uh, or should I say seasons, uh, present <laughs> to your friends and families. You will find there one thing that I have been de developing in my research and writings now for the last um, uh, six years. As Stephen, I used to work with the World Bank in Washington, D.C. for five years, but I'm, I'm fine now. <laughs> I had an opportunity to um, see what other countries are doing. So I created this idea of global educational reform movement as a, it means, it refers to a kind of an unofficial orthodoxy of education policy thinking globally. That people think that, you know, we have to do this, what England is doing, because it must be the right way. Yeah? And if you take the first letters of these red letters, you will see this germ. And you know what germ is? Yeah? It's like a, makes you sick. Yeah? And because I think that this 
global educational reform movement is exactly like the virus that we get when we go to, get, get a flu, right? That th this germ is carried with the ministers and consultants throughout the world and then they infect other ministers and colleagues who believe that this is what we have to do. And these are some of the th things, and Finland has been, you know, we have been affected, infected a little bit with this, between, but Finland has never really got ill or seriously infected by any of these, these germs that are traveling around the world now um, as we speak. You know, one of them is that there, there has been increasingly a focus on academic core subjects, right? Mathematics, literacy, reading and writing, and sometimes a little bit science if it's necessary. And what I have see, realized here in the United States is that there are more and more districts and more and more schools where in early years children only receive these core academic subjects, right? Is this correct? That you are doing less and less social studies and arts and drama and music and more and more these basics that are measured in the tests, right? We have never thought about education like this. We think that it's a, the whole child development is a kind of a key ideal in our education. We have to keep creativity and academic uh, part of curriculum in a, in a good balance. Okay? And we have many elementary schools or primary schools now where they, have, they don't have these subjects anymore in a curriculum. It's all about themes and projects and like larger issues that they're studying. Yeah? In Finnish schools, we are not, by law, allowed to grade our pupils before the fifth grade. You want me to repeat this? <laughs> yeah? So the school is violating a law if it's giving a grade, whether it's a letter or number, to students' performance in school before the fifth grade. Yeah? That's how much we think that the, um, this academic performance is important. The second thing, second idea in this global educational reform movement is the idea of standardization, that creating standards for all sorts of things, but especially for <laughs> teaching and learning and expected outcomes, having a kind of a common standard where everybody has to be taken. Yeah? This is a very, very common way around the world people are talking about this and creating. Germany, for example, now for the first time has created a federal standards for teachers and schools. Yeah? In Finland we believe more in personalization and kind of a customized solutions for schools and teachers. That's why in Finland every school is responsible for their own curriculum. They can design their own curriculum as they wish following the, the national framework. Yeah? So if you go from one primary school to another in Finland you will see very different curricula depending on how the teachers want to use the resources that they have there. Our high school is almost completely based on personalized learning plans where students are following not the grade or not their class, but they're following their own study plan where they may, may study with a different group of students with the different classes in the same day. Yeah? It's a very individualized. This doesn't mean it has not, anything to do with the, with the computers or digital learning. It's more how we design the learning um, uh, for individuals. The third one is the competition. And this is again something that is increasingly popular theme in education policies around the world. This means that we seem to believe that by insisting that the schools and teachers and students, when they compete, they will do better. Yeah? But in Finland, we love to compete in Finland in many things, right? We love competitions almost, if you open a TV in Finland almost at any time there's some type of competition going on there. But we never compete in education. We try to keep the competition away and endorse the community and collaboration and cooperation. Because this is how we see that the education will uh, and should be, should be done. Then the fourth one is the, the global education reform movement idea is the, um, the belief that by offering more choice for parents and students the quality and provision will also improve. Yeah? So that's why we 
how you see this thing in different countries is that there are more private schools and in this country you have more charter schools and independent schools where parents can choose what type of education and school they want to have for their, for their children. We don't, have, we don't think like this in Finland. We have choice for parents, but parents have to choose between two almost identical items. Yeah? It's like uh, you, you want to have a Big Mac or you want to have a Big Mac. <laughs> you can choose. It's made in the same, same place, but it's, a, it's sold by a different vendor. Yeah? It's not like you can go to Wendy's or you can go to McDonald's or something like this. You go to McDonald's and then you choose between Big Mac or Big Mac. Yeah? That's how we think in Finland. In, a, in other words, we put much more access to equity. Yeah? But you know, this choice is, is almost irrelevant in our country because there is very little difference between the schools. You, you remember this picture that the, the difference between the performance difference between Finnish schools is very small. And the other thing is that because we don't measure the schools, we don't have data, we don't know how these schools are, where these good and bad schools are. So parents, if you are a parent in Finland and you are considering a school for your child, the only thing you can, you can use as a criteria is whether the school is offering a different foreign language or whether they are offering more music or sports or something else that you like, that you think is good for your child. But you can never choose the school by saying that they have higher test scores or academic performance in maths and reading than the other school. We, can, we cannot say this because we don't have the data. Okay? Are you still with me? Yeah. I'm going to finish soon, so hold on. And then there's this accountability thing. And sometimes when I look at the, what's going on in this country and some other countries, I, I'm not quite sure if I understand everything. Because part of the story is that in, in Finnish language we don't have the word accountability. I don't know what it means. Yeah? And somebody defined the account accountability to me that accountability is something that is left when responsibility is subtracted. <laughs> but in, in Finnish education policy and educational discourse, if you have a chance to sit with the Finnish educators, well, I think we have a couple of them here, I think we would rather talk about responsibility. Being responsible for providing good education for everybody, being responsible in the community of professionals. That's a, that's a very important ingredient of Finnish education, that you feel this responsibility to your colleagues in the school. Not only being accountable for your students' uh, outcomes, for somebody uh, authority. It's a, it's a very different, different play. And that's why Finland is a country of trust, that we trust one another much more than people normally do in any other country, right? This is not only education, this is a, something that comes from the international surveys and studies. In Scandinavia this is a common thing, that we, we trust one another more than in, in many other places. And it's the same thing in education, that we trust that our teachers will do their jobs. The principal trusts teachers and teachers trust pupils or students. It's simple like this. People often ask me that how do you, how can you build the trust in the education system that doesn't have trust? And I believe that if you have, if you have a strong accountability or if you have a hyper accountability system and a lot of control and inspection and everything is steered from the top, it's very difficult to do practically anything with this trust. Interesting thing with Finland is that when I started teaching in 1980s, we had a very centralized, very uh, steered education system where there was very little trust on teachers or anybody. So we have been able to create this type of system where the trust is a, is a kind of a common thing. Whenever I have American visitors in, in my office or in Finland, I, it's always a joy to have people who have a kind of a real interest in education. I ask them before they go home that what is the what is the kind of a most interesting thing that you take away and you share with your family and colleagues? And many of them say that I have heard about this trust, but now when I see how it works, it's really impressive. Yeah? But it's very difficult to, it's very difficult to take from one education system and put it in another. Don't even try. It's like this TV show saying that don't try this at home. 
<laughs> guess it doesn't work. Okay, I, I close, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to three questions for you. Okay? Um, three questions that I would like to ask you to think about, or you uh, ask you to ask somebody else to think about, and I apologize if some of these things are colored by uh, my ignorance. That's, uh, that may be a deliberate, actually. So the first question is, um, and I was in Chicago on Monday, um, and I asked the same thing with my audience in Illinois, uh, and I'm asking the same thing from you, that do you really need all this testing here? You may have an excuse why you do this, but as an external visitor here in your state and in your country, I have to do this, I have to ask this. Do you really need all these things that you're doing? Because we, and many others, are doing quite different things. There are many countries like England, for example, that is doing away some of, these, uh, some of the old national tests, standardized tests that they had. China, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Canada, many countries are doing away their standardized uh, assessments and replacing them with something else. Something else here could be sample-based testing. Yeah? Why not take a sample of students and test them and then say whether the system is working or not? I had a chance to sit with the Minister of Education the other day and we had a conversation about this question, whether we need to test everybody all the time or whether we can test some of the pupils, a random sample, sometimes. And he didn't understand my point here that we can use this kind of a random kind of a sample-based assessment. So I asked this minister that, Mr. Minister, do you ever go to do the health check? And he said to me that, of course I do. Then I asked him to explain what happens in a clinic, and then he went through all these procedures and said that then the doctor takes a blood test and said, so how does it happen? Does the doctor take all the blood out of your body <laughs> and then measure each and every cubic millimeter and then put the blood back to your body and say that, Mr. Minister, you're quite fine, yeah? No, he said that he, they normally take a three or four of these little samples and then after a while, they're telling me how I'm doing. Yeah. So, so why don't you do the same with your pupils, the school system? You don't need to measure all these individuals all the time. You can just measure something if you want to know whether your, your school system is doing fine. And this minister was very happy about this. <laughs> Saved a lot of money and headache. <laughs> okay. Then the other thing, I think, everywhere, and this is not only, only for, for here, but I, I think the real question is that should we do more to improve the well-being of children in school? Because I'm a strong believer of the fact that unless we have people who are happy, who are healthy, who have uh, uh, healthy meals and healthy te teeth, uh, they're, they're not able to work, uh, learn in a school. And this has been one of the leading policy in Finland since 1970s that we make sure that everybody is happy and fed and healthy in a school before we ask them to learn anything seriously. And I know what is the situation with the child poverty, for example, in this country. I know there is a huge issue of debates here. Some people are saying that the poverty is just an excuse to keep bad teachers in the school. And some people are saying that before we work out this poverty issue, we cannot really do anything serious with the learning. But I think we still, as an educators, we have to think about this well-being um, more seriously everywhere. And finally, um, I sometimes wonder if having more vocational alternatives or options in, a, in your high school would do make a difference, uh, at least in some parts of the country or states, where students could clearly choose a high school option that would be vocationally oriented. Do you know what vocational means? Yeah, it's like a technical, professional thing that leads to, almost like leads to profession. Like in Finland, for example, we have a high school type where when people graduate, they have a job, they have a profession, occupation to do. So many people, this is not only my idea, but many people here in America, when I have traveled, has raised this question as well, that should we have more alternatives in a high school so that kids could do what they would like to do. Yeah. 
All right, let's close here. And I have a last little qu question for you. This is something that somebody here in this country said last March. One thing I never want to see happen is schools that are just teaching to the test because then you are not learning about the world. You are not learning about different cultures. You are not learning about science. You are not learning about math. Who said this? Give me a guess. Einstein. Einstein. Last, last March? <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess Professor Heinemann missed his uh, science class in high school. <laughs> and now I know, I know that nobody wants to try anymore after this. <laughs> okay. So you're President Obama. Yeah? There's a very interesting incident. I happened to be here in the United States that time when um, he, was, uh, he was having a town hall about something completely different, nothing to do with education. And there was somebody there in a town hall meeting asking a question from him through his own children. You know, his kids go to uh, Sidwell School in, in Washington, D.C., so the question was from the mother to the president saying that, how do you feel about standardized testing if it's a part of your children's life? And this is what your president said. And he went on saying that all you're learning is, uh, about is um, how to fill a little bubble on an exam and little ticks that you need to do in order to take a test, and that's not going to make education interesting. It's a wonderful thing. And I think this is a great illustration that when we think about education through our own children, we lay out completely different policies and ideas. You know, this is what we want to see happening to our own children. But when we start to do this for somebody else's children, the policies and thoughts are completely different. So let me leave you with this and thank you very much for your attention. And are you comfortable moderating your own questions or do you want me to moderate for you? Whatever you want. I think it's easier if you do. Sure, yeah, okay. Good. There's time for some questions and um, Klaus is going to... But moderate do, himself. Or do you want to buy my books in a, in a <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's have a little conversation. If you have anything to uh, anything to comment, yes, please. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious about how you get so many people who want to be teachers. Uh, you know, it seems like a lot of the, the system in, um, hinges on having the best quality of teacher. And that, how do you attract that? How do we get good young people to choose teaching? Yeah. yeah. I think there are two, two things really. The question was that why, how do we get the, the able and talented high, high school graduates into teaching? You know, first of all, I'm, I must say that nobody knows this exactly in Finland because we have been trying to ask this from individuals. So we have a lot of anecdotal data from individual students. But I think that there, that there are two things really. One, one of them is that the primary school teacher education and teacher education in general in Finland is a very competitive degree. Yeah? So you study in, a, in a high prestige universities and it's a very demanding program. Uh, it's a research-based uh, study where all the primary school teachers have to do a math master's thesis. They learn the research methods and everything that you would learn in science or anything else. So young people know that if I go to teacher education, I get a great education, yeah? So that's the one thing, that you have to have a good reputation, um, academic, uh, highly regarded academic programs. And these people who, if you have a primary education degree in Finland, you are easily hired, if you want. You can work in any other field. Not only because of this very good degree, but in, the labor, in our current labor markets, employers are really hungry for primary school teachers because they know that they have a great degree and they're great people because you cannot really be on the top 10% unless you are really right person for this type of thing. For example, companies when they're hiring HR people in Finland, they are really headhunting these primary school teachers because they know that they are prepared to do these things already. But then the other thing I think, this uh, quality of academic training is not enough unless you have the conditions in, our, in, in the schools so that the 
what these teachers will do when they are employed is something that they feel uh, like um, that they, they are dignified. You know what I mean? That they, they can use the knowledge and skills that they were trained to do um, in the school. In other words, that there's no, for example, I, I've been asking the young Finnish teachers that what should change in your work that you would leave? I think it's a fair question to ask. What should change in your school or in education in Finland that you would say that, you know, that this is not what I was prepared to do? And many of them say that if there was an inspection, if there was an inspector coming to my class and sitting there for one lesson and two and then telling me whether I'm a good teacher or not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this. Or if there was a standardized testing system that would feed in back data to me and say that whether I'm a high performing or good teacher or whether my school is a good school or not based on this data, I would leave. Okay? So this is how much these Finnish teachers expect that they can use their professional uh, freedom. Also, I think that if our schools were like many other schools in, um, around the world, where the teacher's work is primarily classroom work. Remember this, this picture there? That Finnish teachers in, uh, in primary school, teachers are normally teaching three or four, no more than five class, 45 minute classes a day. So if, but if your, if your teacher's work is teaching from morning until the afternoon, these people didn't go there, they wouldn't go there because they see that the part of the teacher's work is to work with a colleague. Just like if you're in a medical clinic or if you work in a business of law. Yeah? The lawyers don't spend 100% of their time in the courtroom, no? They need to work with their team and prepare the case and do research and all these things, just like teachers need to do. So it's a, what I'm saying is that it's very important that in Finland we have to make sure that we are not changing this professional environment of teacher's work so that they would start to believe that uh, and feel that, you know, I'm not respected and trusted here, because then they will go somewhere else. Sorry? Salary. Teachers, salary is about the same as anybody with a similar degree in public sector. Of course, if you take a lawyer or medical doctor who is working in a private law firm or clinic, they earn much more, but they also have to do much more. But if you, are, if you have a master's degree and you work in a public sector, you, your earnings will be more or less the same as teachers. We have a fairly, fairly steep um, career salary progress in Finland, meaning that the, between the starting salary and the highest end salary in primary education, for example, is about 50-60% increase. <coughs> Here it's about 25. I mean, the, the, the first salary and then the full service salary in the end of the... So this is, this is the difference that we have. Yes, sir. Uh, I noticed your presentation focused almost exclusively on what happens inside school. Do you think there are any social or cultural factors that would play in uh, academic excellence and being generous? Sure. Yeah, culture and traditions and values are very important. And I, I think this trust is one of these cultural values that is not, um, it's not the in-school uh, thing. Um, we are also still fairly homogeneous nation. Finland has about five and a half million people. Five percent of Finns are foreign born. We have five percent, another five percent uh, Finns are speaking Swedish. But that's about it. We have one, about 80 percent of Finns are Lutheran and then there are other religions. So we are still very different to compared to many others. And of course these these issues have a lot to say how education is, uh, is performing. But there are many other countries with the similar factors and a very different performance still. Well, it takes about 40 times more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mathematician, so I would say this. Um, you know, I, I, I want to repeat what I said in the beginning, that I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't try these things at home. Uh, that many of the, you know, the purpose of this book and this presentation is not to say that just take these ingredients of education reform and policy 
put them in your own one and just wait for change. It doesn't, it doesn't work like this. But I, I think one of the main lessons that I would probably draw from, from this book and this presentation is that there, you know, there's a hope for change. And there's so many people now, I have met many, many people around the world who say, who firmly believe that there's no hope anymore in public education. That we have lost the case and we have to find, we have to find another solution. That, so there's no way that we can save and fix this education, public education system. But I think this book is showing that you can transform and turn around things, but you need to have time and you need to have political system that is supporting this. You know, the political system between United States and Finland is very different. You have two parties. When there's a new administration, they clean the table and start from scratch. We have now six parties in our government, and we have always, from one government to another, there's always a party that has been in the previous government. So it's a kind of a sustained um, uh, policy and, and, and reform. So this, we are talking about so different, different things that I would take this, this message more as a message of hope, right? Anybody else? Is there anybody there? Yes, please. Yeah, everybody, <coughs> religious education is compulsory part of our curriculum, okay? So it's normally, it's a Lutheran-based uh, or faith-based um, religious education, but if you are, let's say that you are a Greek Orthodox or Muslim, then you can, you will have your own, you will have your own teacher or you have something else, or you, you don't have to sit there in, in the Lutheran religion class. Yes, yeah, and then there, we have increasing number of those who don't belong to any church. So then the children can choose, they, they normally study ethics or philosophy or something like, or history of religions or something like this. Yeah? But it's con not confession, confessional uh, religion. Anybody else? Let's take a couple of more and then let me take this gentleman there. Yeah, well, we don't know too much about this. The, the, probably the best data and evidence we can have is from the OECD database. About the the question was about the, the more more able and talented students. How do how, how does how is the Finnish education system uh, serving those? The interesting thing is that you know this was a this was a great argument all the way until the first PISA was published in 2001 that the Finnish education system is kind of a killing the talent. This was, th this was actually the terms that they were using. I'm, I'm describing this in the book, so if you want to buy the book and read more about this, go ahead. <laughs> that we, the, our school system is killing the, the talent. Exactly the same was uh, in Sweden, I remember, when the Grundschule was created there. That it's a kind of a keeping everybody, everybody can o only progress to this level. And that's, that's what we meant by equity, but th that was all wrong. But if you look at the OECD data about the the highest performers in OECD data. The interesting thing is that Finland has the, also the highest proportion of these highest performers of all countries, which doesn't mean that they would necessarily be the most, uh, most gifted in the society, but we have a big proportion of those who are able to, to go all the way to the top in this. Should we, do we still have time to take one or two? If you're I know I'm, still long, I'm still awake. I'm still alive. <laughs> and I've been doing a lot of traveling. Yeah. I was in I was in Chicago on Monday, Helsinki on Tuesday, Washington DC on Wednesday, <laughs> New York City yesterday, and now I'm here in uh, Florida. Five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take one question from there. Buy my book. <laughs> no, you don't need to do that. Um, well, we have about 15% of the uh, master's degree for primary school teachers is based on practicums or practical training. So all the universities have, if the university have, has teacher education, they also have the school, they're maintaining the 
so-called teacher training school. And this practicum and practice takes place in, in this school. And it's firstly, it's observing the class. It's a quite a number of lessons that you have to sit there and see how the teachers are teaching. Then you are teaching with the te uh, the, your mentoring teacher or supervising teacher. You teach quite a number of classes. And then the third phase is where you do it independently and then the teacher is observing and giving you feedback. So this is a normal, normal way of doing this. And then we have also the number of micro-teaching practices within the Department of Teacher Education. So it's a, it's a kind of a way of uh, making sure that the the student is ready, ready to go and start teaching. You have, you, we should keep in mind that many of these people who are accepted into primary school teacher education already have teaching practice behind. Because there's a great number of those who will not be successful in their first trial. You know, it's amazing that they come back, they go to school for a year and then they come back and try again. Like my niece, for example, she was a straight A student in high school, really bright girl. And she went to this um, uh, entrance examination five, six years ago. And then they, the, the examination board was asking her that, why do you want to teach? Because with your straight A's, you could be a lawyer or doctor or economist, whatever you want. And she said that, because my uncle is a teacher, <laughs> and my mother and grandfather and everybody else. And they, they, she failed, yeah? Because she didn't have this, she couldn't explain this commitment, why she feels that he wants to, wants to teach. So this panel, when she contacted them afterwards, said that go and work as an assistant for a year. And if you think that this is what you really want to do, then come back and it will be fine. And this is what she did, and now she graduated this, uh, this summer. But this is basically how, how it works. That they, many, many of them already have a pra practical experience from, uh, from before. Let's take one more question. This gentleman over there in the... You, yes. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Thank you very much for this. And, and, and th this is one of these moments when I don't even try to give any advice how to, how to establish or cultivate the trust in the communities where it doesn't exist. You know, how I understand the Finnish system is that we have, as I said before, that the, the, the Finnish culture is built on many elements. And one of them is the the, the very strong sense of and need also to trust other people. When I, when I moved to the United States 10 years ago, this was a very, very difficult thing for me to understand and, and learn to live with. I'm not saying that you don't trust each other here, but it's so different. The whole, the meaning of trust here is very different than it is in Scandinavia. And that's why, you know, if, if your culture is not it doesn't have this type of thing. It's very difficult to do, change anything in education. So you need to have community and society and whole nation that is having at least some parts of these things before you can do. And we have been quite lucky in Finland with many things, and this, this is one of them, that we have a culture and society where people at least still, uh, you know, trust one another, and that's why we have been able to do these things. But it's a great question. Maybe we can think more about this as we move on. But let me thank you once again and wish you happy holidays. <laughs>